So most of you guys are probably familiar with NZXT's build pre-builds or their BLD pre-builds, uh, which I've actually done some coverage on in the past. But now they have their BLD, I don't know if it's a BLD or build, either way, I'll just say build, their build kits. With the build kits, you're basically getting all the components you need to build a system, but they're not assembled. You do it yourself, which is the beauty of PC DIY, and one of my favorite things about PC DIY is the DIY part. Uh, so there's a lot of people out there who wanna build a system themselves, but maybe are struggling with trying to find out which parts go together, uh, because it can be a little overwhelming. Even with sites like PC Part Picker, which does a great job of telling you which components are compatible, there's so many options when it comes to PC parts these days that it can still be overwhelming for someone who's not too familiar with them. At the time that NZXT is launching these build kits, there's currently two options available, two different systems that you can purchase the parts Parts for. There's their Starter Pro, which is uh, I think $13.99 US MSRP, and then there's their streaming PC, which is $15.99 MSRP. Both of them have an RTX 3060 Ti, not too shabby. And then I believe the Starter Pro has a Core i5-11400F, if I'm not mistaken, whereas the higher end streaming PC rocks a Ryzen 5 5600X. And I'm actually not sure which one they sent me. I'm pretty sure they specified at some point, but I, I just forgot. So we're gonna explore that together, we'll find out. And the other thing is that they include a bunch of instructions and, uh, and detailed. I'm gonna assess that pretty closely today and pretend like I don't know anything about building PCs. And if I was a first time builder, would the instructions that NZXT has provided be sufficient to actually build a rig from start to finish? Uh, additionally, even if you get stuck along the way while building, you can call their customer service or you can like get on email or chat with them or phone call and uh, basically contact them and, and get real time tech support for uh, building your system if you hit any snags along the way, which is pretty cool. And obviously there's endless resources online to help you build a PC start to finish. We have a guide as well on our channel um, that's still relevant to this day, but it is always kind of nice to have that one-on-one -on -one direct line of communication with someone who knows what they're doing uh, if you have a very specific question or a specific uh, hurdle that you're trying to get over. Also, two-year warranty on all these parts, So, and it all comes in a single box. Not a bunch of different boxes, but I would, I would assume there's more boxes inside. Why don't we just open it up, see what's inside. Before we continue, this video is brought to you by Raycon Everyday Earbuds. As someone who listens to music every waking minute of the day, the Raycons have been a great addition to my daily regimen, whether I'm building a computer or doing a morning hike. They come with a bunch of different size gel tips for a comfortable fit, and I love their discreet appearance by not sticking out of your ears like some other brands out there. The new Everyday Earbuds offer an improved rubber oil look and feel that's premium all around, and there's also a built-in mic that lets you take calls at the press of a button. I have yet to have one of them fall out of my ears when moving around, and with a 32 hour battery life with 8 hours of playtime, I only charge these things once or twice a week. Like a lot of people, I would consider my taste in music pretty eclectic, and these actually sound really solid with a wide variety of genres I listen to, which is admirable considering that they start at half the price of other premium audio brands. Raycons also come with a 45 day happiness guarantee, so there's really nothing to lose by trying them out. To learn more, click on the link in the description below, or go to buyraycon.com slash bitwit to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. This is a big boy box. I believe regardless of the system you choose, you also get an H510, which is a compact mid tower. I'm wondering how this is all packaged. I feel like the case alone takes up more than half of this box. We'll see how this goes. Okay, so a nice big piece of foam on top. That's reassuring. Packaging material. Wow, look at this. This is a hefty booklet. Are you seeing this right now? Dude, this is actually, okay, this is pretty legit. I mean, it looks nice. It looks nice just at a glance. These are some like full blown illustrated pictures in color. Looks very detailed from, from first glance, but we'll, again, we'll take a closer look at this. This is, this is thick. This is like a Uline book or a Uline catalog that they send me every month and it's just crazy waste of paper. I need to cancel that. All right, we've got a part there. Windows 10, uh, Microsoft Windows 10 64 bit. This is home, Windows home, Windows 10 home. And then we also have artifact pieces. Interesting. This just shows you all the parts that are included with the package. Very nice. What do we got here? Our power supply, Seasonic S12 3, 650 watt. That should be plenty to drive our CPU and GPU, uh, regardless of which model we got. Again, the GPU is gonna be consuming the most amount of power and it's the same regardless of which option you go with. We have a Kraken M22 120 millimeter liquid AIO. I would assume that this is the starter. Hold on, this is probably the starter piece. Hold on, what is this? Bag contains BCDI 
Okay, I gotta look at the, the legend here. BCDI, so there's uh, the, the RAM, we've got the CPU in here, NVMe SSD, and a Wi-Fi card. That should all be inside of this box, if the legend is correct. Okay, we have a Wi-Fi card that is from, oh, it's an MSI card, MSI Wi-Fi card. Looks like it just slots into one of your uh, PCI uh, slots on the motherboard. It's got a USB 2.0 connection or cable. It goes to your motherboard and a couple antennas. Our AMD AM4 CPU. So we got the we got the streaming PC. This is a 5600X, yeah? Yes, it is. Six cores, 12 threads. All right. Memory, I believe is 16 gigs. They gave us two eight gig sticks of T-Force Vulcan Z DDR4. 3200 speed. I would have liked to see 3600, considering that this is a Ryzen 5000 series chip on Zen 3, and it likes fast memory and it can handle 3600, but we can always try our hand at overclocking it once we're in the BIOS and the system's fully built. Uh, we also have a gigabyte RTX 3060 Ti, and this is the uh, OC edition with RGB Fusion 2.0, Windforce Cooler, yada, yada, yada. Okay, honestly, this alone is a huge selling point for the BLD or the build kits from NZXT. Just the fact that you're kind of guaranteed to get an RTX 3060 Ti, which is a smoke and fast GPU, uh, and you don't have to pay an extremely outrageous price for it. You don't have to wait in an extremely outrageous line for it. It just comes included, like you're just buying milk at the store. But the online online store. Don't don't buy milk online. We also have a little kit for tools. So we have a screwdriver, several bits inside, wires. Oh, these are probably just wire cutters for zip ties and stuff. So that's kind of nice. They give you all the tools you'll need to build a PC. Not that you need that many anyway, but it is kind of nice that they've got some zip ties in here. Um, they do have, they do include both Phillips head bits, uh, two different sizes, one for the N NVMe SSD install and the other for your general screws elsewhere. So that's cool. And what is this? A keychain flashlight. Really? Do we really need this? Who's building in the dark? Let's go. But let's go ahead and find out. Oh no. Did I forget to pay the electrical bill? Calling Southern California Edison. Your estimated wait time is over 15 minutes. I don't know. Maybe your power goes out and it's... <laughs> you need to build a PC immediately. And of course, our H510 compact mid tower case. I think they asked me what, oh, I got white. I got a white one. I think I requested that. I'm cool with that. I like white. All right, that's everything in the box. Oh my gosh, I just realized I, I forgot two components. Uh, this is all so overwhelming. I wasn't keeping track of which parts I had gone over, but we have a motherboard here, which I didn't really expect it to be an NZXT board because those are generally more premium uh, given the price point of these systems. But this is an MSI uh, B550A Pro. CEC, all black motherboard. Looks like it's got some pretty nice heat sinks on the VRM. Not exactly sure what the power delivery is, but um, I'm sure it's more than capable of handling a 5600X. We have some nice rear IO, a couple of USB 3, USB C, and two M.2 slots, plenty of PCIe by 16 slots, and four DIMM slots, of course. It is an ATX form factor, as you would expect. So that looks nice. And then we also have the SSD that I also forgot which is, it is a one terabyte WD Blue SN550. So I believe this is an NVMe PCIe Gen 3 drive. Uh, one, one terabyte is nice. Storage is also very easy to expand in the future should you need more storage. Uh, but this is, a, this is a good drive, SN550. I have a couple of these that I've bought with my own money because I think they actually offer a pretty good price to performance. Um, and uh, and they're, they're quite fast for, for what they are. So at this point, I'm just gonna start building the PC exclusively with the help of their adventurer's map for PC building, as they've called it on the front. There's something else in here. What is this? Building checklist. Okay, we're gonna go through all this right now and hopefully, hopefully it goes well. All right, we are underway and I've got the booklet over here. I'm gonna be following it step by step. We'll be uh, taking a look to see exactly how NZXTs lay this all out for, for new builders, presumably new builders, or those with limited experience who don't know how to build themselves. So for starters here at the beginning of the guide, we have uh, an actual QR code that'll link us to a playlist of videos. Uh, it also suggests that you can use factory manuals. All the products that we received um, that normally come with manuals have the manuals included in the package as well. So you can always consult 
those if you get uh, extra stuck. Uh, we also have online tech chat support with a link there and a call center with uh, a working phone number, I would presume, in case you get stuck and need to talk to someone. So we've got a little intro here, journey begins. I'm not gonna go through every single page, this thing's huge. Uh, installing the memory, level one. So first step, they actually want us to install the memory first. What you'll need, RAM sticks and motherboard. It's also labeled with the legend there, parts A and B, in case you don't know what individual components are actually called, which, which is fair, some people might not if it's their first time. And then down here is a QR code with a video walkthrough on how to install memory should we need it. I don't think we'll need the video for that. Let's just see if we can get, if we can scrape by installing the memory with, with these lovely illustrated pictures and descriptions. So little graph here identifying where the memory gets installed into the DIMM slots. Prepare the motherboard. Say the cables that come with the board won't be used for this build. Take out your motherboard and place it gently on the box it came in. The memory channels will be located in the top right corner of the motherboard. It's actually kind of nice that they tell you to elevate the board and put it on uh, the box that it came with because not everyone has a fancy schmancy Gamers Nexus mod mat like I do. So I'm going to go ahead and listen to NZXT for the purpose of this video and grab the box that the board came in. So we did that. Uh, we located the dim slots right here and locate channels two and four. Uh, and then it has it labeled right there very clearly, two and four alternating second and fourth slot. Look at RAM channels two and four. These channels are paired to one another, giving you the most efficient use of your RAM. If labeled differently, check your motherboard manual for clarification. All right, uh, that's, that's also kind of nice that they fill you in a little bit, a very high level explanation of why the RAM stick should go in the specified slot locations because it's for optimal performance. Press down on the lane two and four channel tabs. Your motherboard may only have tabs on one side to push down. That's good that they specify that because that can throw off some people. So we've got our two tabs here. We only have a single tab on each DIMM slot. Let's go to D, orient the memory sticks. Typically, if there is a white sticker on your memory sticks, this white sticker will be facing into the board towards where the CPU socket is located. Kind of a, an interesting way to describe it or to instruct it. Do they even mention the notch? Align the memory gold connectors. The top of the gold RAM connectors is longer than the bottom. Okay, this makes it so there's only one correct orientation. Make sure the RAM matches the openings on the motherboard lanes, otherwise it will not go in. Okay, so they don't specifically mention a notch, but they, they kind of do in a roundabout way. So I've identified the notch. One side of the slot does have more gold context than the other. It's pretty obvious and then push the RAM firmly. Upon installation, pull the RAM twice to make sure it isn't loose. Make sure that the gold, okay, hold on. It's telling me to, I was supposed to install the RAM on, on step E. So let me go ahead and do that. Uh-huh. Upon installation, pull the RAM twice to make sure it isn't loose. Double, double check. Pull twice on each stick. Seems firm. And make sure that the gold connectors are properly aligned before applying force. Probably should have checked that before I just pushed them down. Press down until you hear a click. Oh, okay, be careful, but don't be afraid to push firmly. It may require some extra force. That's that's a good tip. That's a good tip, because I feel like a lot of first-time builders are pretty nervous or paranoid that uh, applying excess force to certain com computer parts are, are, is gonna break them. Um, um, and that's not always the case. It, it definitely does apply in some instances, but for things like installing your RAM or sometimes like tightening down your, your liquid cooler or even an air cooler for your CPU, uh, you really do need to use uh, maybe a bit more force than initially feels comfortable. Um, if, if you're not too familiar with, with uh, installing those components. So it's good that they actually make a note of that. Uh, the halls breathe with life. Few souls have made it past this point as we head into the halls of Machu Picchu. Wait, Machu Poot. Puck Chu, Puck, Machu Peak. Oh, they're trying to make a Puck reference. Uh, it's dumb. Hidden treasures and lost secrets lie before us. Beware of the traps and pitfalls that may delay you throughout your journey to the treasure room. The tra okay, they're making it like story based or something. What was it like Tomb Raider? Tomb Raider, the PC build. Level two, installing the processor. Careful on this step. The pins of the CPU or motherboard are easily bent, and if they're damaged, they may not work properly. That's that's important to note. Video walkthrough right there. And take care on this step. Do not touch the pins. The pins of the CPU or motherboard are easily bent, and if they get damaged, they may, may not work properly anymore. The CPU is the most fragile part of your build. Make absolutely certain you do not touch or bend the gold pins on either the CPU or the CPU socket uh, situated on the motherboard um, for AMD or Intel respectively. When handling the CPU, be careful and hold it by its sides. These are all good points to keep in mind. Uh, AMD CPU 1, Intel CPU 2, identifying, it says your CPU will either say AMD or Intel on it. This is important as the instructions will differ, uh, will be different for both. Keep an eye out in this guide for these colored boxes labeled AMD and Intel. They will indicate what steps to take for your build. That makes it very clear cut. Locate the CPU socket. The upper middle area of the motherboard will have a rectangular or square socket for your CPU with a metal retention arm if lost or if you're unsure, you can always refer to the motherboard manual for additional help. Inspect the pins. Uh, we should inspect the pins. 
All right, so this is all red, AMD CPU, AMD CPU, so all these instructions are uh, appropriate for the build at hand. Open the socket, unlatch the CPU socket by pressing on the metal retention arm and bringing it all the way up. Okay, pressing on it and bringing it all the way up. So if you just press on the bar, nothing happens. You kind of have to press the bar down and then swing it out away from the socket before it'll actually lift up. It doesn't exactly specify that here. It does have an arrow though. It does have a little arrow, but not everyone's gonna catch that. It would have been good if they said, you know, push it down and then kind of swing it out, outward, in order for it to be uh, released upwards. Um, so that's something to note. Identify the corner marker. Hold the CPU by the sides. Do not touch the gold pins. Identify the corner of the CPU that has the arrow. Yep, okay, straightforward. Place the CPU. Align the marked corner daughter triangle on the CPU with the marked corner of the socket. Do not force or move. Place gently. All right, that's, those are good, good tips. We're gonna go ahead and just slot it in and close the socket, pull down and latch the metal retention arm onto the socket. Dur, 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 dur. Easy enough. All right. Level three, installing the M.2 NVMe SSD. The, the drive itself, the motherboard, screwdriver handle, and the PH0 bit. I have my own screwdriver, so I'm not gonna use their stuff, but uh, it's good that they specify. Uh, Pucky found a hidden SSD. Okay, he's found an M.2 NVMe SSD marked D with Windows 10, already pre-installed on the drive. That's cool. Uh, take your M.2 SSD out of its packaging, holding on to the edges of the drive. Okay. A, you can do this or this. Not all motherboards have an M.2 shield. Sizes of shield may vary. Near the middle of the motherboard, typically just below the CPU, you will find a slot for the M.2 drive. It is sometimes covered by an M.2 shield, two screws, and sometimes it is attached by the port itself, one screw. Check your motherboard manual if unsure. So we have so we have two M.2 slots on this board, one with an M.2 heatsink or shield on top of it, and the other one that's just uh, pretty much exposed. I'm gonna opt for the top slot, and it even has a little graph here uh, to show you kind of whereabouts the M.2 slot may be. Step B, remove the screws. Depending on your board, you may have one to three screws. Some boards have the screws provided separately in the box. Determine if there is an M.2 shield that needs to be removed. If so, unscrew it from the board. All right, let's go ahead and remove these two screws, which will allow us to remove the M.2 shield. Set aside the screws, yes, of course. Insert the SSD at an angle, matching the notch to the connector. If done correctly, the gold should not be visible. That's that's a good detail to bear in mind. So let's see, at an angle. Mm -hmm. Gold is, gold contacts are no longer visible. Ensure proper seating. Your SSD will be pointing upwards at an angle. If it is not, re retrace step D and make sure the drive is properly installed. Looks like it's at an upward angle here, so that's good. Push down the M.2 drive. With the shield on top of the M.2 drive, if one came with your motherboard, push down the M.2 SSD towards the board. Yoink. Screw in the SSD. You may need to skip this step if you have an M.2 shield and remove exactly two screws on step B. Ah, that's a good, that's a good note. Very good note there, NZXT. Fasten the screw you removed on step B to secure the SSD. So uh, we do have um, one of the screws that uh, was holding our M.2 shield in place is the same screw that, that holds the actual drive in place as well. Uh, peel off the M.2 shield plastic. Missing this step may cause your drive to overheat. That is true. So we got that. Screw in the M.2 shield. Uh, ba -ba -ba, holding the SSD to the board, screw the SSD onto the motherboard using the two screws you set aside on step C. And there is two. Boom, boom, done. Level four, installing the CPU cooler. This is just letting you know how to distinguish whether you have an AIO or an air cooler. Level four, installing the AIO cooler. Okay, so we, we need this part because we, we have an AIO. That 120 mil. So this is AMD CPU, AMD CPU, so this is good. Prepare the motherboard. Important, the M22 AIO cooler came pre-configured for an Intel CPU. Skip steps A1 through A4 if you have an Intel CPU, which we do not. Remove the stock AMD mounting bracket and backplate from the motherboard. Loosen the Intel retention bracket, remove the Intel retention bracket, attach the AMD retention bracket. Okay, that's all, that's all super straightforward as well. Let's go ahead and do that. I'll, uh, I'll remove the, the brackets off the, the motherboard after this. Doing a little bit out of order here, but doesn't really matter. So remove the Intel retention bracket and it tells you which direction it pulls out. There we go. Attach the AMD retention bracket, which goes like this. Easy peasy. Screw pegs in here. This is a universal backplate. Find which holes match your CPU and fit the motherboard. Make sure the backplate is properly vertically oriented before doing so. 
Install the screws. Following the illustrations on steps B and C, install the M2 screws labeled G in AI AIO manual and standoff screws labeled E in AIO manual. Both came with your cooler onto your back plate, matching the holes with your CPU. Pretty clear diagram here. So let's go ahead and do that. We've got our back plate and the illustration that they provided here is actually of an AMD installation. So we can just copy that to real easy. Looks like there's a screw that kind of slots in, kind of keyed. So it actually holds in place pretty nicely. And then you have a little screw to screw in from the back side and hold that longer screw in place. Give me a sec while I finish this up. All right, back plate looks pretty prepped there. Install the back plate, align the holes of the back plate to those in your motherboard and screw the back plate onto your motherboard. But first we have to remove those mounting brackets. So the guy does explain how to remove these just with these four screws, two on either bracket. Super easy, boom. Yep. And boom, and now we can remove, let's see, now we can go ahead and install our back plate. Uh, we don't need the stock back plate, obviously, just the one that we prepped earlier. Slots through, install spacers onto the standoff screws. Okay, push them down, one, two, three, and four. Secure the bracket. To temporarily secure the cooler bracket to the motherboard, screw the washers and thumb nuts with springs onto the standoffs. Leave the other cooler parts untouched. We will resume installing them at a later stage of the building process. Okay, so they're just telling us to, to cinch it down a little bit so that our back plate doesn't fly away while we're moving the motherboard around and stuff. So to do that, just install a washer and it says, uh, screw the washers and thumb nuts with springs onto the standoffs. Okay, so my assumption is that they're gonna have us install the motherboard first into the case before we actually mount the pump block to the CPU. Makes sense for a lot of new builders. It's probably gonna be a little less cumbersome that way once the board's already planted to the case. And uh, I'll be interested to see if they have us install the radiator to the case before the pump block. I would think not. I would think the pump block would go on first, but you never know. It doesn't really matter too much. It doesn't matter a whole lot either way. You will resume installing this cooler at a later stage in the build. Keep track and safely store away all provided screws and materials that you've, you have not yet used. Oh, I'm just gonna be risky and not do that. Level 4B, installing an air cooler, which we can skip. Level 5, moving the build into the PC. Having difficulty unboxing the H510 case, ensure the carry handles are folded outward. Okay. What you'll need, H510 motherboard, screwdriver. Discovery of the H510. Aww. Take it from its packaging and have the motherboard on standby for the next step. Okay, let's get the case out. All right, we got the case out. Let's continue. Unscrew the glass paneling. The thumb screw holding the glass panel is captive, meaning it won't come completely off the tab. Turn the screw until it wobbles in place. Aye, aye, Captain. Unclip the glass panel. On the rear of the PC where the panel was unscrewed is a metal pull tab. Bracing the glass with one hand, pull on this tab. This may require some force. That is also accurate. Brace it, pull. Oh, that was not the most graceful. Put the panel away gently, which we have done. Unscrew the rear paneling. Unscrew the captive screws holding the rear panel in place located at the back of the case and remove the rear panel. Uh, da, 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 da. You will find uh, included a box of parts necessary to continue building your PC in one of the compartments. Okay. And there's our accessory box right there in the hard drive cage. Place the PC. Now is a good time to place the PC on its side. Okay, so so for removing the tempered glass panel, they don't actually say to keep the system upright, but they do have a, a picture of it um, standing upright. So I guess it would have been nice for them to actually include that though. I'm sure maybe in the video, maybe in the video it, it specifies, but they do eventually tell you to put the case on its side here in step H. So place it down gently with the open interior facing upwards, okay? Identify the IO shield. If pre-attached, skip to page 68. An metallic IO shield will be provided with your motherboard. In many cases, it may be pre-attached to the board already, though often it is provided as a separate piece. In our case, the motherboard does not have a pre-installed IO shield. You've gotta do that separately here. If your IO shield is provided separately, put the metallic IO shield into the rectangular opening in the back of the PC, shiny side facing inwards. Okay, and match the orientation of the IO cutouts to your motherboard, good. Uh, press firmly on all four corners of the IO shield until it pops in. Don't be afraid to bend the metal to better fit the ports. Okay, it's all sound advice. I also kind of wish that they had suggested or warned builders to, to be careful not to cut themselves because IO shields can be rather sharp. So then we got that, place the motherboard 
Um, place your motherboard into the PC case angled towards the I.O. shield. Align the ports on the motherboard with the holes of the rear I.O. so that they fit together. Find the screws in the flat baggie. And instead you'll find many screws with a rounded top. Secure the motherboard. Align your board with the middle standoff in the case. The screw, uh, screw holes of the motherboard should align with those inside the case. Using the PH2 bit, fasten the motherboard to the inside of the case using the round 632 flat screws found in the white box on step G. Depending on your board, some screw holes may not be used. Okay, pretty specific, very clearly laid out. So let's do that. Find that center standoff. There we go. I'm gonna bend one of the one of the little metal tabs sticking out here. It's kind of blocking our ethernet port, which the guy did say that that was fine if you needed to move some of those out of the way to make the ports fit better. And that looks great. All right, motherboard installed. Level six, relocating fans. Choose your path. We have AIO cooler. You've arrived at a divergent path. If you have an AIO cooler marked E, continue normally and skip pages 82 to 89. Woohoo! Level six A, relocating fans. AIO build, that's us. Okay. Remove the plastic twist ties. Well, for starters, I wanna see where they're having us relocate the fans to. Probably to the front of the case so that we can make room for the 120 rad at the back. But let me just double check. Uh-huh, yeah, they're having us move the fans to the front. And then, oh, this is for the air cooler build. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll reach that point when we get to it, but let's go ahead and relocate these fans first. Remove the plastic twist ties. There should be four twist ties holding the wires in the back of the case. Remove them by cutting or untwisting them. Then unscrew the top fan while holding onto the top fan. Remove the four screws that hold the top fan to the case. Gently lower the fan and pull the wire through the case opening before setting it aside. I'm just gonna read like do these read these in bulk and then we'll, we'll do it all at once. Unscrew the rear fan, pretty much the same thing. Set aside the fans. Uh, the fans you just removed will be reinstalled to the front of the PC case on step H. Set the them aside, but keep them close. Really, I was gonna, gonna ship them to Africa right after removing them. It's a good thing they met, it's good. So the guide said to remove or kind of untether the wires at the back here first. They could have also specified what the end of the, the fan connector looks like, right? They could have mentioned that uh, to look for the three pin connector on the fan cables, just to make it a little bit easier to identify. Unscrew the fan bracket. Okay, unscrew the two thumb screws holding the fan bracket at the front interior of the PC. Remove the fan bracket from the PC as pictured above. Easy. Fan blades pointed outwards, no guard showing. Fan blades pointed inwards, X-shaped guard showing. Makes it very easy to distinguish the difference. Place fans onto bracket. Place the two fans onto the bracket, X-shaped guard showing. Position the fans towards the bottom of the fan bracket with wires pointing to the left. Oh, that's good. Good that they made a note to uh, clean up your cable management where possible by orienting your fan the correct way, not just uh, with intake or exhaust, but which direction the the, uh, the actual wire is facing as well. So we place the fans onto the bracket, flip the bracket with the fans over, maintaining their position relative to the bracket, screw fans into the bracket. Screw the case fans into the bracket using the provided screws. Extras can be found on the white box. Okay, from this angle, the fans, the fan cables will now be on the right side of the bracket. Mm-hmm. All right. Screw down to Chinatown. All right, slide in the fan bracket, running the fan cables through the two large case openings, which are right here and they've identified them in the picture as well. Slide the fans into the PC with X-shaped guard showing. X-shaped guard is showing. Slip the cables in to the openings and reattach the fan bracket. Attach the bracket back onto the front interior of the PC using the two thumb screws. Gotta shove these cables through a little bit more, otherwise they'll get pinched. All right, now they're having us install the power supply next. Okay. I, I'm guessing that they're gonna save the CPU cooler till the very end, like right when we're about ready to install the graphics card. That way, when we're doing cable management and stuff, there's no AIO tubes or pump block in the way. That's my guess. Uh, but let's go ahead and follow this here. Power supply. All right, and then it says, if you have a non-modular versus semi-modular or modular, we have a non-modular power supply. Our Seasonic uh, unit is non-modular. So uh, skip to page 99. Slide in the PSU with fan facing down. Nice little graphic here to show you exactly how that's supposed to go into your case. Pretty straightforward there. Secure the PSU, press the PSU against the rear of the PC and screw it into the case using the four 632 hexagon screws that came with the power supply, also in the white box from the H510 case. Okay. All right, we've got our Seasonic PSU you here. We're just gonna slide it in from the side, making sure that the fan is face down, of course, as noted by the guide. And then we gotta just press it up against the back of the case and screw it down. All right, there we go. Easy. 
Level eight, cable management. Oh, interesting. Okay, there's gonna be a lot of little steps in here. Okay, this is actually a pretty useful page. Cable management, these are our recommendations on how to manage your cables more easily. They don't need to be strictly followed. Don't be afraid to experiment with different configurations. So that's cool. If you want NZXT to hold your hand through the cable management process, they've actually outlined exactly where they recommend or suggest uh, specific cables to go. So you've got your audio connector, USB-C front panel, uh, USB 3, System Fan 1 for your AIO, System Fan 2, which came with your, your PC case for the AIO and cooler, get your 8-pin EPS for the CPU, PCIe cable for your graphics card, and 24-pin for your motherboard. And it's all color-coordinated, so it's really easy to visualize where NZXT suggests your cable should go and, uh, and the routing path for each of them. But again, just a suggestion. Designed to help, zip ties and Velcro are your friends. For better cable management, we advise grouping cables together and using the provided Velcro or zip ties to fasten them to one another. Okay, sound advice. Where to plug in the cables. Bring out the manual that came with your motherboard. The port names we provide in the upcoming section are commonly used, but they may not be exact. The manual will be very helpful, uh, very in bold, that is true, uh, during the upcoming steps in identifying exactly where each cable port is located on your motherboard model. That is fair because uh, the location of various headers on a motherboard vary wildly between models, so it's kind of impossible for NZXT to tell you exactly where things should plug in, but the fact that they point you to the uh, user manual that came with your motherboard is a good thing. I do like how they specify here that your 24 pin and 8 pin uh, EPS cable came included with your power supply. I could easily see a first time builder who has no idea what they're doing um, trying to look for you know the 24 pin cable in, in like the accessory box or something uh, and not realizing that it could just be already tethered to their non-modular power supply or something like that. Here we got fan cables, little diagram of you know potential fan headers on the motherboard. It does say location of ports may vary by board, which is absolutely true. It's a good thing they remind you of that and uh, more routing suggestions here for your fans. I'm gonna ignore all of their suggestions and just, just do it how I want. But it's good that they have this jumping off point for, for people who might not be as confident. All right, and then it says, the greatest threat handled, huzzah, the cable menace is almost defeated. We're almost ready to move to the next room. All right, blah, 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 blah. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and mess around with the cable management really quick and be right back. All right, a good chunk of our cable management is out of the way. So now we can move on to the cooling chambers, installing our CPU cooler. Finally, here we go. All right, this is AIO, good. Remove the thumb screws, or the, the, the thumb nuts, the thumb nuts and washers. The thumb nuts, that's a funny, funny term. Install the water block. Example above is of an AMD installation. That's very convenient all that all these diagrams are, are of AMD and we're doing an AMD build. Try not to touch the thermal paste on the underside of the cooler. Try not to. Do or do not, there is no try. Place the pump with the retention bracket onto the CPU. Make sure the USB port is facing the top and the two pump tubes are on the right side of the pump. Ensure the standoffs go through the holes on the bracket. Duly noted. So it's not having us install any of the cables on the pump block just yet, it's just having us secure it. Do in fact have thermal paste pre-applied on the bottom and then screw in the plastic washers and the thumb nuts with springs that we removed earlier in step A onto the standoff screws. Why of course. All right, now moving on to the radiator fan installation. And once again, NZXT is showing us which way we should orient the fan uh, and which way it should be mounted to the radiator rather. And it looks like, uh, okay, we don't want the guard showing. We don't want this side showing. We want the blades, fan blades pointed outwards with no guard showing. Okay, and then attach to the radiator using the included screws. And it doesn't specify washers in the text, but it does have a uh, visual uh, picture of them. But I think that's pretty clear, especially because the, the washers and screws come packaged together. Most people should be able to figure that out, but let's go ahead and install the fan. All right, sorry you guys aren't gonna get the best visual of me installing this this fan because of uh, just a little tricky here with the camera. But um, one thing that NZXT didn't specify this time around is which way to mount the fan in terms of for best cable management, aesthetics and stuff. So I would of course recommend that the wire come out from the back side of the case, pointed towards the motherboard, like so, if you're gonna be mounting it in this orientation. It's interesting how they included that for uh, when we relive. It's interesting that they included that detail when we were relocating the fans, uh, the case fans to the front of the chassis, but not for this step for some reason. And I'm sure a lot of people will be able to figure it out, especially since they were already instructed on how to orient the wires uh, previously, but it still would have been nice for them to include that little bit. Okay, now we're gonna mount the radiator to the back of the case. 
Slide the fan into place on the rear case exhaust with the pump tubes oriented at the top. Mount the radiator. Important we advise orienting the pump tube at the top. Using the 5mm case screws that came with the AIO, mount the fan radiator to the rear exhaust of the case. And then connect the power cable set. The cable will be found attached to the radiator. Connect the three pin pump power cable to the four pin CPU OPT pump or AIO pump connectors on the motherboard. Then here it gives you an approximate location of where that header would be. And it also specifies location of ports may vary by board. So again, they want us to mount it so that the tubes are at the top. And we also have the fan cable, which I would assume is the next step in this guide. Yes, connect the fan cable to CPU fan. So actually I should connect the, the pump to the pump header. Pump, there is a pump header right next to the CPU fan header. And then we'll connect the fan cable to the CPU fan header. That makes sense. Okay, we'll worry about tidying these up later. Connect the micro USB cable from the pump to an available USB 2.0 internal connector to the motherboard, commonly labeled as JUSB2, USB1, 2, USB, or FUSB2. Okie dokie. And then again, location of ports may vary by board. All right, this goes in here. Boom. Oh, does it not specify to route the cable behind the motherboard tray? It does not. Interesting. Locate the top PCIe lane. Use the topmost PCIe lane on the bottom left side of the motherboard. You'll find all the PCIe lanes. Locate the top, okay, right here. Boom, boom, got it, Locate it. Slide out the metal panel. Note, do not lose these screws. Do they really need to note that? Like why would, I mean, wh why should you lose anything? That's part of the case. Anyway, if you haven't already on the rear of the PC, loosen the thumb screws on the panel that is blocking the expansion slot covers. Slide the panel out of place. Keep this panel unscrewed for now. Okay. Maybe they say not to lose the screws just because they're one of the few non-captive thumb screws that you'll actually use in this build with this case. Remove rear expansion slot covers. Unscrew the expansion slot covers. Usually covers two and three from the top located at the rear of the PC corresponding to the topmost PCIe lane near the processor. Keep screws for step H. All right, does that apply here? Slots two and three from the top? Yes, those would be the correct ones. They got that right. Remove pin cover. Remove the plastic plugs in the GPU ports and the plastic cover that is protecting the golden pins of the GPU. Here's our RTX 3060 Ti. We're gonna remove this. Uh, it doesn't actually say to not touch the gold contacts, interestingly enough. I mean, touching them isn't quite as bad, nearly as bad as like touching the gold contacts or the gold pins on a CPU or CPU socket, for example, but I would still think that would, that would be mentioned. Although maybe it's obvious because it comes with a cover on it already, but people don't really notice the obvious. I'm being honest. The average person, kind of dumb. Open the PCIe slot, press down on the wing of the topmost PCIe lane. Insert the GPU into the topmost PCIe lane so that the ports align with the openings on the lane. The two teeth of the GPU PCIe cover will slide in between the case and motherboard. Ensure proper seating. The PCIe lane will audibly click when the GPU is properly seated in the lane. Let's test that out, shall we? Okay, I mean, there, there was a click, but you can't even really hear it beyond the thud, the thud noise that the GPU makes when it clashes with the board if we can if we do it slower the click is really not that audible to be honest i feel like i feel like that that might worry people if they're like listening for the click and they don't really hear like a pronounced click they might wonder if it's actually slotted in properly see if i can reproduce this click you definitely get it with dram installation but here it's eh. fortunately it's really easy to tell when the gpu is slotted in there it feels very firm very firm indeed secure the gpu fasten the same screws you removed on step c to firmly hold the gpu in place and bring down the metal panel slide the metal panel back into place and secure it by tightening the thumb screws okay i think i know what the next step is Lug it in the gpu locate the 12 pin connector if you have a founder's edition card underneath the gpu you will find a box containing a connector cable and gpu manuals uh, take the connector out of the box at this stage uh, or plug in the cable for an fe from nvidia okay fe more fe stuff no cable management note to like zip tie the the loose pcie cable or the un uh, potentially unused pcie cable but uh, that is something i would definitely suggest doing if you want to tidy things up a bit so let's do that i'm just going to use the twist tie rather than a zip tie. I would ordinarily use a zip tie because it just looks cleaner, but. All right. And what could be left? Finishing touches. Finishing touches. Hook the rear panel. Okay, with the exhaust holes nearest the front of the PC, you will find two latches on the rear panel that will correspond to two holes on the PC. Hook them on. Swing closed the panel. Why not say swing the panel closed or close the, what? Okay, whatever. With the panel secure in the front, swing the panel, uh, the back of the panel towards the PC. Make sure that no wires get in the way when closing the PC panel. Secure the rear panel. Use the thumb screws 
and then close the glass panel. Uh, did it not specify to remove the sticker, the plastic peel on the AIO that I'm gonna take off right now? All right, right side panel, and there's a final look at the cable management. It all came together pretty nicely without too much effort. That PSU shroud definitely helps, of course. So latch the hooks on the holes and then swing it closed and screw down. All right, I'm actually gonna not put the, the tempered glass panel on just yet because I wanna boot the system, make sure it's working all fine and dandy and uh, that way we can see it easily without any, uh, any glare or reflections. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And actually, by the way, here's a quick look at some of the final pages of the instruction guide. Secure the glass panel, attach the Wi-Fi antennas, plug in the power cable, plug in display cables. This is actually pretty huge to have. This is very important. A lot of people, a lot of first time builders will plug their display port or their HDMI cable into the motherboard if it does have a display output or two, rather than the graphics card itself. So good thing they specified that. And there's even a tiny URL uh, link here that probably gives you more information on that. Dun, 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 dun. Ethernet, peripherals, turn on the power supply, turn on the PC. Oh, update drivers. We advise checking for and downloading driver updates on the official websites of your hardware for optimal performance. This QR code and link will take you to a list of websites that have drivers. That is very handy. Very nice of them to include. And quest complete. You've made it to the treasure room. The treasure room, I wasn't really aware we were headed towards, but uh, okay. Common problems and fixes. Sure, make sure it was powered correctly. Check display cables. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, so some, some basic troubleshooting steps in case your PC isn't functioning properly when you first try to boot it. That's all good and dandy. Maybe uh, can save you an extra call or an extra email to their customer support team. And finally, this this is just a, a picture of, of me. Oh, this is, this is Pucky. And as you can see, he's under quite a heavy load right there. All right, end of the book. Let's turn this computer on. All right, we got this bad boy all plugged in, powered up, ready to go. I don't see any LEDs turning on, but I don't think there are any LEDs uh, that, that would be uh, active right now anyway, even if the system was working and plugged in, but let's just give it a shot. Yeah, there we go. There we go, there's our RGB. Mm, boom, yes. Just This thing is just oozing with, with RGB lighting. Uh, but it looks like it's working. I do have the display port uh, cable connected to the monitor here. So if all goes well, we should see a post. Is this thing on? Is this thing on? Boom, boom, boom. Okay, F1 to run setup. My keyboard should probably be plugged in before I try to use it. God, Kyle. Okay, keyboard's plugged in now. Uh, one thing I noticed here, it does say DRAM frequency for DDR4, 2400 megahertz dual channel. Uh, so it's recognizing the RAM properly, but it's worth noting that right now our, our DRAM is running at 2400 megahertz or mega transfers per second. It would have been cool for NZXT to also include uh, just a little tidbit on maybe how to, to get your, your system memory working at its rated speed, which in this case would be 3200 mega transfers per second. But I also kind of understand the complexity of that because that can vary from board to board. And also once users start configuring BIOS settings, things can go south pretty quickly if they don't know what they're doing. But it would have been cool just to have like maybe make a note like, hey, your memory's not running at its optimal speed. We suggest that you do some research online to figure out how to properly configure those settings. Just just a thought. Side note there. Okay, F1. Let's, uh, and we are in the BIOS. In the BIOS. Okay, it looks like it was already set up. So let's go ahead and hopefully it'll boot from the SSD into Windows because Windows is again uh, pre-installed, pre-loaded onto the drive for your convenience. There we go. Windows boot, yeah, yeah, buddy. All right, all right, all right. This thing is ready to rock. And honestly, this was a pretty smooth experience. I'm, I'm fairly impressed with the with the guidebook. You know, honestly, there were a couple things that they missed that I would have liked to see included. I had, what, maybe a, a half a dozen critiques or so of things that I'd like to see in here, but none of those were, they, they were all pretty minor things, kind of just like, nothing that was left out was super detrimental or what I would consider a deal breaker. Uh, you can still easily build a PC from start to finish using just this guide. And we didn't even take a look at any of the videos, uh, the, any of the video walkthroughs that are provided as well. Didn't have to contact customer support. All those options are available to you though should you run into any issues again. And this is just a really nice book to have. I wonder if NZXT would ever consider just selling this. I, I bet a lot of people would buy this thing just a la carte even if they didn't purchase one of these build kits because it's just it's a nice it's a nice book and honestly they did a really good job. They took their time with it. It is you know to their credit it is pretty illustrative and, and kind of artsy and fun for whatever that's worth. I, this would be like a good like I, I put this on my coffee table. This is going on my coffee table. NZXT you should sell this. People would buy 
buy it. But that is the NZXT build kit in a nutshell, y'all. I, I like this. I like this concept. And I think it's, it's I don't think it's like a, an incredibly unique idea. I think it's probably done been done in the past, but I, I don't think I've ever seen it done this well. Like the execution here, I think is pretty top notch. Um, the guidebook is really kind of the, the focal point of this whole thing. Like if the guidebook sucked, then I think the whole experience would, would just be crappy. But fortunately, that's not the case. I think it also offers a pretty good value for what you're getting. 15, what is it? 1599 for this particular system, Ryzen 5 5600X, RTX 3060 Ti, not too shabby at all, in my opinion. But you guys let me know what you think down in the comments below. Toss a like on this video if you enjoyed it and get subscribed for more tech content coming at you really soon. I will see you guys in the next video. Pew.